Very good. Uh, I guess I'm the last to introduce myself. My name is Blake Gibson. I'm with Jones Hamilton Company, the makers of PLT. Um, I think most of you guys probably know who we are. We have a liver making uh, company. I've been, uh, I've been with Jones Hamilton 20 years. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about litter management today. This is not a PLT story. I think that uh, we uh, we do we, we have a lot of uh, great folks that are out in the field that will help you with that. And we just hired a new uh, rep for this area. His name is Tom Lewis. You guys are in the you both the producers. You may just Tom just raise your hand back there. Uh, he'll be up working in this area uh, from this point forward. Um, my objective today is just to get you to think more about your litter. Ultimately, we, when we place birds in the house, a lot of times we think about that baby chick the moment that he steps foot on the floor. But the reality is, your floor is a living, breathing organism. It is constantly replicating, it's constantly producing, whether it be noxious gases, it's producing more organic material, it's producing uh, all these nutrients that the uh, uh, University of Kentucky brought uh, to the table earlier. Everything that they're telling you and everything about the nutrient value is ultimately determined how you manage that litter. Okay? And so from a baby chick standpoint, it is critical, and I should change the presentation because I say that we're on litter one time, a year, one time in, in, the, in the life till we clean out. Because from the point after the first block, you're on manure. And so we have to learn how to properly manage manure so that we get the biggest bang for our buck from a bird performance standpoint. I grew up on a boiler farm. I have my family had 12 boiler farms out of North. I grew up in South Carolina. Uh, we grew for a company out of North Georgia. And one of the things that I learned very early in life was is that closer you are to the floor, the more you hate it. So as a little kid that had to wash eight foot trough drinkers, I was constantly had sinus infections. My eyes were red because I was in the highest amount of ammonia. My dad was six foot tall. He never smelled the ammonia. You say never said we had ammonia in the house when growing up. And I'm like, I smell it. Nope, we don't have ammonia in the house. So one of the things that I've learned is that producers a lot of times don't detect what's in the house. And and most producers, my dad would say, if I if I can't hear it, see it, smell it, or breathe it, it doesn't work. We use our five senses every day in making financial decisions based about our houses. So hopefully what I'll do today is just give you some visual pictures that you can go back and, uh, and, and put into place. I know there's several folks that I've given this presentation for. Ms. Nancy Butler, I've been to her place many times and worked with her on litter management. Um, if I can't help you understand your litter management, I don't care what litter management you're using, you're not going to have an effective program. And so hopefully that's what we'll be able to demonstrate today. First of all, we know we've got manure there. How many of us know what's in that manure? How many of us know how many bacteria is in that manure? Well, there's a lot of things that are going on in that litter. That litter is just like you and I, and it's just like those birds. It's a living, breathing organism. How you treat it is going to determine how it's going to impact your flock, and the flock after, and the flock after. Okay? It's a highly enriched environment of microorganisms, different viruses, um, a lot of different gases. How many gases do you think come off your floor? Anybody have an idea? How many do we smell? One, ammonia. I can tell you that there's four major gases that impact the life of your flock. How many of you guys have wind roads? Okay, we'll talk a little bit about it. When you move all of this litter, and when you go in there and you decake, hopefully you're decaking, uh, but if you do till your litter, when you add an oxygen component to that litter base, you actually change the ecology of that floor. You cause the microorganisms to start replicating. That's the reason. How many of you notice when you windrow you have high ammonia? If you've got high ammonia, it's because the bacteria is producing the ammonia. So it's a great indicator of how much is going on in that floor. How many of you, when you've decaked out, see all those feathers come back up on the surface of your floor three or four days later? You ever figured out why that happens? Beetles are not there, it's too cold. That floor is constantly shifting and moving because of the replication of the bacteria. One E. coli can replicate into one billion in 24 hours. One salmonella can replicate into one trillion in 24 hours. So if you just look at those two organisms that impact our flocks, we have a lot of replication under optimal conditions. When is optimal conditions? When birds are in the house. When I've got a heat source and I've got a nutrient source, I am constantly going to be replicating bacteria. So I say litter is an opportunistic environment. That means it's either going to be your best friend or your worst enemy. 
And it probably has been your best friend at one point, and it's probably been your worst enemy at some point throughout your career of growing birds. So how we manage that environment will determine how successful we are with our litter management. Guys, I tell you, litter management has got to come before bait and chicken placement. If you put litter management the three days or four days after your birds moved out, you've already set your next flock coming up for a, for a failure at some, some point. You're going to lose money on that flock if you've waited until those birds move out. Litter management is a balancing act between bird, bird production and the longevity of that litter. We talked about earlier about the nutrient value of that litter. I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Because it is becoming a better, a more uh, money-making commodity. We have to understand how you manage that litter will ultimately determine what the nutrient value of that litter is when you get ready to clean out. We talk about bacteria a little bit. Everything is pH dependent. The blood in your body, the saliva in your mouth, the pH in your gut. Everything, your body is depending on certain pHs. The same thing happens in these floors. Typical broiler litter today, even turkey litter, somewhere has a pH of between 7.8 and 8.2 is the typical pH of your floors. If we look at this graph here, and this, was, this came out of a, out of a Alabama uh, uh, culture science lab many years ago, was that if we have a seven pH of 7.4 or greater, we look at E. coli, Clostridium salmonella, we have heavy growth. So that tells me that in a higher pH, the predominantly bad bacteria that challenge in our flocks are the optimal condition. How you manage that litter is going to determine how much of that heavy growth is going to impact your flock. The good thing about most of these bacteria is what we call facultative anaerobic. They'll live on the top of the surface, but they prefer to be down here where there's no oxygen. They've got a good heat source, they've got a nutrient source, they've got water filtrating through the floor. So this is their breeding ground down here. But when you add that oxygen to the floor, how many of you ever had dermatitis? You, most people won't raise their hand when I ask that question. If you've ever had dermatitis and you add that oxygen component, bloom. That's the reason you have that, that mortality starts off at maybe 30 birds, then it goes to 50 birds, then it goes to 100 birds. It's because it starts to sporulate when you add the oxygen component to it. So it's important that we understand pH changes everything from a microbial standpoint in these houses. So what about ammonia? If I took each of you, we talked about this earlier, if I take each of you out to a farm and I set a standard ammonia in that house and I'll get 50 parts per million, what are they in here, 35 people, 40 people? How many different readings am I going to get? 35 or 40 different readings, okay? The problem with that is, is that we become very desensitized to ammonia. Myself personally, because I've worked with ammonia for 20 years, I do not detect 100 parts per million ammonia. It smells like the air in this building. I can't smell it. I can get right in the floor, you can take a bottle of household ammonia and squeeze it right under my nose, I'll never smell it. Because I'm desensitized to it. But someone who is not in a poultry facility on a continual basis, 100 parts per million ammonia may actually knock them out. Okay? So each of you have different thresholds of where you can detect ammonia, and it is critical for you to understand what that threshold is, because you're making a financial decision based off of this every day. And the unfortunate part is, is that you make that financial decision six feet off the floor. And I'll show you that ammonia concentration that's impacting your flock is at about from the knee down. Okay? Not many of us get down on our hands or knees when our baby chicks come and see if they got ammonia. We don't do that at two weeks. We don't do that at four weeks of age. But it is critical to understand, we never shut down the ammonia volatility off that floor. The only, what, the only thing we can do is we can regulate the amount of ammonia coming off of that floor based on how we manage the litter. If you've got ammonia gas coming off the floor, guess what you're doing to the litter from a, from a crop standpoint? Y'all remember what the gentleman said earlier? If you've got ammonia gas coming off, you lose the value of that litter when it goes into the field. So our objective is, is to keep the litter in the litter. Keep the, me, keep the ammonia in the litter. If I can keep the ammonia in the litter, it won't impact the bird, and, it's, and you're going to have a better product at the end of the flock when you clean out. The amount of nitrogen that's in the litter is solely depending on what, what your company is feeding as a diet. So for every 1%, that we increase the crude protein over the basal metabolic needs of that bird, we're going to increase the amount of ammonia excretion by 20 to 30%. The bigger the bird, 
the more money that that bird is going to produce. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Just for instance, on a one and a half, we, birds consume about one and a half million pounds of feed per year on a seven pound bird per house. So you think on one and a half million tons of feed, or excuse me, one and a half million pounds of feed, you multiply that times 20%, whatever the protein rate is. 15 years ago, we actually, we averaged fed somewhere in the neighborhood of about an 18 to 19% protein diet. Today, we see starter diets 23%. So we typically in the last 10 years have went up about 5% on our crude protein. So if we take 5%, we multiply times that times 20, guess how much, how much ammonia volatility have we increased? 100%. So the ammonia that we had yesterday is not equivalent to the ammonia that we have today. So that's a really critical uh, to understand is what the ammonia that you had last year is not the same ammonia that you've got today. It does accumulate, it does exponentiate over the life of the litter. How much leaves that litter and goes into the environment is basically there's two reasons that that'll happen. One is it's temperature. And you all know when you turn your heat on, you get the ammonia gas coming off. Typically, that's a that's surface area. That's within about the first inch, inch and a half of that litter base. That's the reason you get that high level ammonia. Unless you're wind rolling, about an inch, inch and a half is where the ammonia gas, the liquid ammonia, is going to convert to a gas. The only thing that you and I can impact is surface area. If you're de in your house, the depth that you run your caker will determine how much ammonia volatility you're going to have in the house. It will also determine how much microbial population that you're going to be setting your birds up to be challenged with. This is some work. This, there's a new ammonia detector device that's coming out of uh, Georgia Tech. I'm very, it's very promising and I like it. It can take an ammonia reading every two minutes. These devices are not cheap. They're about $2,000 per farm. Do I tell every producer to go out and buy one? Absolutely not. But what it was, what it will tell us is, and it's something that we can go out and look at, is that this was last summer. This was in Georgia, Alabama. And what we looked at here, here's where the producer turned his heat on. He came into work. You see the ammonia drop back down. He cut it. He went back. He left. He cut his fans back off. The ammonia purge started back up. He came back in to put his feet out. He said, well, the ammonia's too high in here, so he left his fans running. Actually, he left them on thermostats, so his thermostats kicked on because it got too hot in the house. So when he got ready to place birds, and there was no litter amendment on this farm, you can see that the birds for the first four to five days, excuse me, four, five day, four days, was an ammonia of excessing 80 parts per million. Folks, 80 parts per million is where it blinds birds. When you have ammonia at 50 parts, you all are leaving somewhere in the neighborhood of three to five points of feed conversion going right out, right out the fans. So it's important to understand that you keep your ammonia under 25 ppm because it is impacting your wallet. And 25 ppm, five feet in the air, is not going to make you one dime. It's the 25 ppm that is critical on that floor. This is some work that, that was done by uh, Dr. Miles many years ago, but it looked at vertical ammonia, uh, excuse me, uh, stratification of ammonia. And to show that ammonia is a very light gas, he just looked at, this was brand new litter, that what we looked at is that at the litter surface, we were still, right after the birds put in the house, we actually got about 12 parts per million. At one foot, it dropped down to about seven foot. When we got the three feet in the air, we were down to less than five parts. So this, all this graph is showing you is, is that the higher you are off of the floor, the less the ammonia detection you're going to be able to realize. So it is critical that you learn how to properly test for ammonia in your houses. So what's it cost us? We can't detect it. It affects our wallet. These are some pretty sound numbers. 20 years of research has showed at 50 ppm, we leave about a half a pound of weight on the table. And guys, it's not just you, it's around the world. I, I have the privilege of going to China, South America, Canada. I've traveled to pretty much every poultry company in the world in the last four or five years. And I can tell you, everybody does the same thing. It's very unique. You are very unique group of people around the world. Everybody is almost very, very, very similar in how we produce. So every producer potentially is leaving that half a pound of weight on the table. Every Tyson grower, every Purdue grower, every Pilgrim's grower, 
all leave this money on the table because we we don't know how to utilize the devices and, and the detections that are out there today to help us maintain less than 50 ppm of ammonia. If we've got 300 or 30,000 birds in a house on a four pound bird, this was uh, down in Georgia, this is Aurora Pay, that producer's leaves, losing about $735 per house. So you take that on a four house farm, you're about $3,000 per flock just because you let your money get above 50 ppm. And it's not that it has to stay constant, guys. It's that the ammonia has to hit the birds for just a short period of time at 50 ppm. I mean, raise your hands. How many of you have ever been in a house and ammonia so high you came out and you feel like you got a lump of coal in your chest? Okay? Y'all know what happens? Physiologically, what happens when you're taking a breath in, your cilia that's in your trachea, when you take a breath in, Everybody do that. Take a deep breath in. I want you to feel it. Y'all feel that kind of coolness and that pressure on your chest? Y'all feel that? Your cilia are beating upward and they're pushing the mucus up. When 50 parts per million ammonia hit that, it actually burns those cilia. When you walk out and you still got that lump of coal in your chest, you've paralyzed every cilia in your trachea. You just broke down your first line of defense to, provide, to prevent any bacteria in your body. At feet when you allow that to happen. That's the reason you come in, you come out, you're coughing, you're clearing your throat. How many of you see your birds coughing and clearing your throat? Birds don't have a diaphragm. So all that happens is, is when that stuff dies, is that all that stuff falls right back down to the trunk of the tree and you sit there and you see your birds gasping for air. Okay? They drown in their own fluids. And that's what the ammonia does to the bird. You and I have different reflexes and we can get that out. But moving on, because I know we're short on time, I've got to step up a little bit. Five points of feed conversion. These feed costs is a little bit high for today, but we're losing about $1,725 per house. So on a million bird complex, a company is losing $87,500 per week just on 50 parts per million ammonia. If you take into consideration what that ammonia is doing, it's going to have downgrades, it's going to have uniformity issues, we're going to have some condemns, from leucosis or maybe some air sac. We're going to have uh, pulp quality is going to be degraded. So we're looking at a summer neighborhood of about $100,000 per week on a million bird operation. Let me tell you folks, that ain't $100,000 just to your company. It's $100,000 over who all works, whoever settled for that week. So whatever the company loses, you lose on top of it. So I always tell folks, where does litter management start? Never ever let your litter management start when your birds come about. Always look at your litter management. When these birds are three to four weeks of age, guys, your litter should be telling you what's going on. If you have cage on the sidewall, or do you have cage under the drinkers, or do you have cage in the sun? Each one is telling you something different. If you have cage on the sidewall, what does that tell us? Why do we get cage on the sidewall? Two problems, typically. One of the gentlemen, one of the guys that's just selling a product out here is telling me why. Insulation issues. And the older your houses get, the looser they get, the more that cold air is going to be on this sidewall, you're going to have wetter cake on the sidewall. Typically, it's a ventilation issue. Your houses, they get loose, they don't pull air like they should. Where do birds go when they're not comfortable? Right here. What happens to that bird if he's cold? He's not going to eat to fight off challenges. He's going to eat to stay warm. He's not going to eat right away. So it's under important. Cake can tell you a lot about how the performance of your flock is going to be. What if I've got wet cake under my drinker lines? What does that tell me? i got a water line management issue. Maybe my drinker lines are just old and need to be replaced. I know there's a big push to go through, and some of the equipment guys are in here talking about putting nipples in houses. Guys, the lines wear out. And a new nipple that you put in your house is not the same nipple that was designed for that line. And I see a lot of farms four or five years later are going back and their nipples are drinking, are dripping again. Fix the problem. Am I running my regulators too high? Do I have my water lines level? How many of you, when you windrow, how many of you level with the streams? If you windrow your litter, it is critical, day one, three, five, and seven, that you level with the stream because that litter is going to be recompacted by the birds. If you get undrink, uneven drinker lines, you're going to have wetter litter under your drinkers. We look at houses left open, wide open. How many of you leave your houses wide open between flocks? It's okay if you do. Just raise your hand. Let me know. 
a neighbor raise their hand. I know that it happens because I go by a lot of farms every day and I see houses wide open. This was a common practice for the last 40 years. I remember my dad saying we leave the curtains down on the house because, quote, we get rid of gum borer virus. Need sunlight now. We need to let them float air out. What we have realized and we've learned is airing out a house does not grow a good bird. When I let this house, when I, put, when I leave it open and I allow it to go to ambient temperature, and let's say that in October or November we've got ambient temperature of 35, 40 degrees, and that core of that litter gets to 40 degrees, what's happening to the microbial population in that litter? It goes dormant. Ammonia and bacterial population really don't start until the core of that litter gets to 85 degrees. So anything below 85 degrees, you just tell it to take a nap. When you add that heat back on, you start smelling that ammonia, that's the bacteria starting to replicate again. Okay? So it's important that we understand the importance of keeping these houses closed up tight. So for the value of time, you can talk to me afterwards. I can go into more depth with that with you about the sweating issues and things of that nature. But I want to just show you that this was in February. We looked at the ambient temperature and in that floor. It was 54 degrees, 48 hours after we moved birds. The relative humidity is 25%, so that tells me the water is still on the floor. And the ammonia is, is about 30 parts. We're not moving a lot of ammonia off during that downtime. If I can get the ammonia out during the downtime, it ain't going to challenge me that much in the place of time. So by keeping these houses closed up tight and we keep that vicious cycle of that living cycle of the bacteria, the ammonia is going to get very heavy in that litter or in that air. It's okay. Gas ammonia will not go back in the floor unless you add a water component to it. Ammonia is in two forms. Liquid, gas. The liquid, we can live with. The gas is what does the damage. House closed up tight, same house, side by side, 48 hours after bird movement, 78 degrees. We were 54 degrees in the other house left open. So just surface temp alone, I had a 24 degree differential to my advantage. This is what's key. I tell service folks every day when I'm out working with them, I don't care about surface temp anymore. I want to know what the litter is two inches under the litter. Because if I know what the litter is two inches under the depth, or two, two inches in depth in the litter, is that I know I'm going to have warm floors for my baby chicks. Litter has a high R value, and it's very easy to heat up on the surface. But if you've got a cold litter pack, you're going to have cold baby chicks. I'm at 104 degrees. I'm 50 degrees hotter in this house than I was the house I left open. I'm generating by COVID population. I'm pushing ammonia off, and it's not costing me one red cent. And on the back side of this is, is I'm going to cut my fuel costs because I'm still going to have core litter temp when I turn the heat back on for my next block, even if you're at a three-week now time. 63% relative humidity means the moisture's coming off. And the ammonia, I tell you, is at 100 parts. 100 parts of gas ammonia is not going to go back in that floor. If you've got to work in there, you ventilate. If you're not working in there, keep it closed tight. And this just looked at seven days. You can see that the house we left open, look where the core litter temperature dropped. Dropped down to 54 degrees. The house that I had closed up tight, I'm at 84 degrees. So if I'm on a week or two week downtime, I'm not gonna burn a whole lot of fuel to get back up to my target temp of 90 degrees. So here's a fuel savings for you. It's free of charge. Just take advantage of it if you can. So ventilation is the key. We use ventilation to control moisture first, then ammonia. Lastly, we use ventilation to control the temperature. But because of the cost in the industry, we have this reversed, as, as most producers reverse this as a priority. So we always want to ventilate for moisture first, relative humidity. Ideal relative humidity in your house should always be between 50 to 70 percent. If you're above 70 percent, you're not ventilating enough. If you're below 50 percent, you may be over ventilating. And I tell producers, if you got a million dollar operation out here, you got a half a million dollar operation out here, you got a two hundred fifty thousand dollar operation. If you don't know how to test your ammonia and you don't know what your relative humidity is, and you're utilizing this, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. Ammonia detectors, two hundred bucks. Relative humidity meters, fifteen bucks. A lot of folks have the digital meters. Let me tell you, I've got a big concern with the digital meters. I've done a lot of work with them. You have to constantly calibrate them. They were designed for a processing plant with a sterile air environment. 
most of like your your process and plants your birds go to probably do use them. Your service guy may use them. The problem is that they don't have a high enough threshold limit. I go into a lot of farms today that are only is two to three hundred parts during the downtime, and the best we can get on those things is a hundred parts. After that hundred part trigger, you have to recalibrate. Otherwise, he will not give you the true mark on the monkey reading. That's the reason I still stick with the old gun, the gun and, and tube stick. People say, well, the tubes are expensive. We can teach you how to utilize a box of tubes on a four-house farm. A box of tubes should last you two flocks. Because if you go in the house and you smell ammonia and high pull it, you already know it's too high. If you don't detect ammonia, that's when you want to use a tube. Two most critical compact... Uh, components when your birds move out. What I do? First is close your house up tightly. Minimum ventilate at night if the moisture forms, but as soon as you notice that, don't ventilate during the night because you bring in all that moist air back in that you took out during the driest part of the day. You only ventilate between 10 and 5. Anything after 5 o'clock, you bring all that moisture back in that you took out during the day. Two drivers of ammonia release is going to be the temperature and the surface area. How hot I keep the floor and how deep I, de I decay the litter. Proper decay. This is where I think the industry is losing, has lost a little bit of ground. Is that we constantly have to educate you guys is more is not better. Actually, less is better. Only decay where your cake is. Only take the cake out. And the last thing I would encourage you is to never till your houses. When you take a big piece of cake, I'm going to steal somebody's piece of paper now for a short of time. This is my piece of cake. When you look at your cake in your house, the ammonia is coming from around the edges because this is hard and dry and packed. You have very little ammonia coming out of this. When you go in there and you take a, a, de a tiller and you till it, what did I just do? How many pieces, how much surface area do I have now? See how many pieces of cake I made? And then on top of that, guess what I did? I buried it outside out of mine. I made pretty litter. Pretty fluffy litter doesn't grow over good birds, folks. If it did, we'd all be on number one every time, right? I always say that poultry producers have a nurturing gene. We want pretty litter. But if I come in your house and I vacuum your carpet and I leave vacuum lines, does that mean your carpet's clean? Because I could get Stanley and Steamer to come in right behind me and we'd see how much junk was still in your carpet. Same thing with your floors. When you bury pieces of cake, you just buried a nutrient source for all the microbial population down here. T tillers are cheap, decakers are not. But I'll tell you, for dollar for dollar, and long term, you're going to always come out better taking the cake out of the house, especially in that brood chamber. It is critical. If you windrow, that's another subject. I can come in and talk to you about windrow. I'm not a proponent of windrow in every flock. People ask me that all the time. When you move litter, you start to lose a component. You're either going to lose your moisture, or you're going to lose your your uh, your carbon source. We have to have a certain amount of moisture in litter. Ideally, anywhere from 10 to 20% of active water that needs to stay in that litter at any given time. So litter assessment. Look at your litter. Let it tell you what it needs to do. Look from sidewall to sidewall. Where's my cake formation? Look, is it on just on the tunnel end or is it on the back end? If it's on the tunnel end, then just focus on the tunnel end. Don't focus in the back end of the house. Only take out the cake that was in there. And you only take out the cake that that flock put in. And most of you guys, I know the size of birds you grow, the, the maximum would be four inches is about as deep as you'll ever run a deep cake. It doesn't have to be pretty. It just needs to be taking the cake that that flock put out. That is the nutrient source. That is the ammonia source for your next flock. Can't see this very much. This is on the brood end. Here's the cake. Live hall didn't rub me out. I have no cake in the center. I have no cake on the sidewall. This producer needs to spend 15 minutes in his house, and that's it. All he needs to do is decake, and I can tell you it stops right there. He needs to run that decaker right there, and that's it. We don't need to decake a house from sidewall to sidewall to make it look pretty. We are creating more of a microbial challenge for our flocks than we necessarily have to. I used to tell my, I, I service birds for Purdue Farms down in South Carolina for many years before I went to work for Jones Hamilton. And I used to tell my producers, I want to see a half dollar size piece of cake in the under each sprinkler line that let me know, let me know that, that I had the right amount of water flow coming out of that nipple. 
what did I learn later on was that I was creating a disaster for my producers. Because just because I see that, what was happening is, is all that water was filtrating down into the litter to the pad. How many of you cleaned out and you got that big black tar layer down there? That is nothing more but a microbial haven. That is the Jamaica of the poultry house for bacteria. And so when I let all that water go to the floor, all that ammonia, every gallon of water that goes through your litter, folks, you get one gallon of ammonia production. So that means if I've got 60,000 or 50,000 gallons of water going through your house a flock, you've got 50 to 60,000 gallons of ammonia production. And if I allow it to go all the way to the floor, you never get it back out. It stays in the floor. And that's the reason when you clean out, sometimes you still smell high amounts of ammonia. What do we do to this farm? Some of you producers in here, what would you do? Growers just moved out. Literally, look, we do our assessment. Okay, no okay. What I need to do? Close it up, put it back in production. It's okay. It's okay to not let every, to not be cake every flock. Are you going to get by with that very frequently? No. That right there was a July flock. You might get by with it once a year. Might, you might get by with it once every two years. But it's okay. If you don't have any cake, and just because I got a little bit of rutting right here, doesn't necessarily mean I need to take a deep paper in there. I'm going there with a piece of chain link fence and a log and level that house up, minimize my surface area, reduce the amount of ammonia volatility, close it back up into production, and you're ready to go. We don't see many houses like this anymore. This is an old picture. So there is a difference between litter prepping where we crust or we till or we skim or partial litter removal. How many of you do partial litter removals? Where you go in and you take a lump sum of litter out every now and then. If you do, all I would encourage you is do not take the center litter out of the house. Take the sidewall litter. It's a little bit harder to do that. But remember, this is what, remember your, your pads are sloped a little bit. This is the highly enriched environment of ammonia and bacteria. This is the highest value of litter that you've got in your house. The air, the, the way that we bring air in and we dry litter, the, dry, the driest litter is in the center of the house. This is your best litter from, from, a, from a baby chick standpoint. So take this nasty stuff out, level this back out over, and if you have to top dress, you top dress. But the one thing you've got to be careful with is the ammonia is going to be horrific. Don't just think because you're taking this wet out that you're not going to have a lot of ammonia. You gotta, you're going to have to use a heavy litter limit, whatever it is, the product that you're using. Uh -oh. Well, keep that little button. Do it as soon as the birds move. Don't wait three days. Don't say, I need a break. You do more harm for your next baby chicks by letting that litter sit there for three or four days because that solid piece of cake litter does not let the ammonia gas evaporate. And what it does, it causes the microbial population to generate. So you have, if you wait 48 hours, that bacterial load that was low when the birds move may have exponentiated now that the birds are out of the house. So do it as close to movement as you possibly can. If you got to wait a day, wait a day. Let your house ventilate while you decay, but close it back up tight when you're finished. Measure how deep your cake is. Go through the house and measure. I see a lot of this. I got my deep caker in there, it takes me three hours. If you're telling me it's taking me three hours to do a house, I can tell you you're deep caking too much, too deep and too wide. You don't need to run a deep caker, like I said, any more than two to four inches of litter depth. When you move all that litter right there, right there, that's nine inches of litter that's in that house. You have ununiformity in flocks. You have ununiformity in water lines. We have ununiformity just about in every aspect. Our ventilation is very difficult to regulate when you move that much litter base. Remember, everything is about micromanaging today, folks. It's not the way that we grew birds 15 or 20 years ago. If you want to be competitive, you better figure out how to micromanage your houses. And that goes from ventilation, water line management, and litter management. How many of you use decakers? It is critical. Challenge yourself. Pull that decaker in, run it 20 feet, get off of it. If you got a service tech there, get them to work with you. Get off the tractor, stop it, leave the blade where it's depth, just like this Lewis out here, leave it at the depth that you've got it, kick it back till you find the depth of the plate. I love these devices, but I've talked to the folks many times that make them in the KFC, the KFC, excuse me, the KMC. The problem is they've got an indicator up here that you watch. And for you, that tells you inches. But the problem is if your litter is very deep 
and you've overmanaged it and your tire is miring down this much on the back end and you've said you've got that set at two inches, you're actually decaying seven inches. So you want to get off and dig and see where that blade is in the depth. Is it deeper than what the cake is? Five minutes. Pull 20 more feet and do it again. I tell folks, do the front end of your house, do the back end of your house. That way you've got the, the middle will be covered. Because you're either going to have heavy cake on the front end or heavy cake on the back end. Watch your, watch your screen. Are you seeing just the cake going up? Or are you seeing all the fines going up? Guys, am I running, running tight? Okay. This farm here took us one year, same litter base. He just managed his litter from the deep as depth as he possibly could. I got him to start working with our program. That's what the flock looked like one year later. Birds just moved out. We didn't need to be caked yet. Lyle hauled in, brought him out. He doesn't have any cake under his drinkers or his feed lines. All because we micromanaged his water, feed, his water lines and his ventilation. Wrap up. I got two slides left and we're done. We talked about Nutri Clinton. Wanted me to talk a little bit about Nutri Value of Litter. And then these numbers, these are out of the University of Georgia, so they're a little bit higher. And that's one of the things that I, that I found interesting in the conversations earlier is the value of litter does change regionally. In states, currently an inorganic lit nitrogen litter is currently valued somewhere between $105 and $130 a ton based on nitrogen alone in Georgia. PLT, people ask us, what does PLT do to my litter? Well, we help improve the nitrogen phosphorus ratio in poultry litter due to the retention of the ammonia and the ammonia in the litter. We break it apart. So, interestingly, the total of phosphorus are typically 20% lower the higher the rate of litter rent that you use just, just because we displace that phosphorus. Chemically, for every 100 pounds of PLT that you put on your floor, you're going to neutralize 29 pounds of ammonia gas, or um, liquid ammonia. Well, that doesn't sound like much. I tell producers, here's a visual. It's about the size of your gas tank on the outside of your house. It's a lot of ammonia. That converts, and that's going to give you 55 pounds of ammonium sulfate. That's the fertilizer that we were talking about earlier. About 59 pounds of sodium sulfate, that's some salt, um, and about 15 pounds of water. If we look at the amount of nit retained nitrogen, if we look at, we get, if we at 50-pound rate of PLT, you're going to get about 3.5%, 4%. The higher the rates you use, you're going to get about another percent, three percent and a half the higher the rates that you use. And that's going to happen for the longevity of the litter. One flock of PLT or any litter millet is not going to give, increase the value of your litter. It's flock after flock after flock of using that litter millet, whatever it is. So in conclusion, I know we went over probably a few minutes. We've been late for relative humidity in the brooding, 50 to 70 percent. Keep the houses shut up tight during the downtime. Minimize how much you decay so that you minimize that surface area. Preheat and purge the ammonia to a minimum of 85 degrees at placement. Apply the right amount of litter minimum. Your litter minimum is going to be based on the amount of manure that you've got in the house. One to three flocks, you may get by with a minimal break. Anything after that third flock, you better be prepared to use a little more litter minimum no matter what product it is that you're using. Design a litter management critical control points in your house. Understand have one for water, have one for your, your uh, ventilation, and have one for litter. Bring value to litter, not only for chicks, but for your crops. It's twofold. You, if you lose it on your chicks, you're going to lose it in the fields. And I always say, we'll never improve what we constantly tolerate. You've been kind of educated on litter management. I went through it pretty fast. I'll be out over here at our table to have conversations with you if you're interested. Um, and I appreciate it. I apologize for right. a little short on time. Thank you. We'll have two more introductions real quick, and then we'll uh, eat. Question. Yes. Five points to the bird. Say that the producer is working their dog for a But the company can save $100,000 a week. And you can't talk to them to punish them. <laughs> that's five million dollars a year. That's the reason you have a brand new, awesome salesman that's going to help you do that. <laughs> you can't. And, and I mean, I'll go work for you. I'll just be happy. Right. And that, the, the issue is, is that we, and that's a big, broad state number of 50 parts for me. That is what they leave on the table. Will we ever retain that all 50 parts? No, we're not. We're going to get that five points. 
No. If we can get two points, then that's where the advantage is coming. So yes, you're never going to get 100% of anything. But typically, if you look at what 50, 50 parts per million cost a company across the board, if everybody was at 50, and I can tell you that everybody in here is 50 plus, typically, um, even though they say 25 is their limit, I don't see very many farms that gets below 20, 25. That there is a lot of money being left on the table. Any other questions? Sure. Excellent. Good morning, folks. Uh, my name is uh, Tim Epp. I'm with Ecodrum Composter. Uh, the Ecodrum is a way of, or is, is an automatic, um, or, or an automated method of composting and bar mortalities. Uh, it's pretty simple. It doesn't take a lot of uh, manpower. It's very quick.